Hello everyone and welcome back. In the first video in this series, we briefly looked at the history of English in order to see how it has changed and become the unique language that it is today. In the last video, we identified some of the specific difficulties language learners have with the English language. In this video, we will discuss some practical ways to mitigate these difficulties along with relevant resources. However, whenever a language learner has a difficulty, whether in the classroom or elsewhere, we should first consider whether the difficulty is language related or not. This is because not all English learner difficulties are due to language. There can actually be a number of other factors at play. So what are some of the difficulties an English learner might have, for example, in the classroom? First, there is basic language proficiency. That is, they have a limited vocabulary and a limited grammar. Depending on how long someone has lived in an English speaking country or how long they've been learning English, they're probably going to have a vastly smaller vocabulary than any native speakers in a classroom or in a workplace. So for example, if they've been living in the United States for only one or two years, they're probably only going to have a vocabulary of 2,000 to 4,000 words. If they've been living here for longer, they might have a vocabulary up to maybe 10,000 words. But that is much less than a native speaker, as we looked at in the last video. A native speaker of English in America who's graduating high school knows approximately 40,000 words. So essentially, a non-native speaker is trying to do the work of 40,000 words, at least, with only 4,000 words or something like that. So this can cause many difficulties in the classroom. However, there's also academic language to consider. As we looked at in the last video, academic language can be quite different from the common spoken language that many language learners learn through conversation. And then there's social language. The difficulty with social language is the speed at which native speakers talk, the pronunciation that they might use, for example, depending on what part of the country they live in, and the idiomatic language that they use, like idioms, jargon, slang, etc. Another difficulty is just generally U.S. culture and academic culture. So there might be a problem understanding what is okay to talk about with your peers and what's not okay to talk about, or what's okay to talk about with the teacher and what's not okay to talk about. Or if someone comes from a country where they're expected to just sit in class and listen to the teacher talk, they might not ask questions even if they have them. Then there are those students with limited or interrupted formal education. Many English learners who have come to the United States as refugees often had limited or interrupted education in their home country. For example, I've met a number of students from West Africa who had their education interrupted from Ebola outbreaks or from civil war in their countries. And because of this, they're not going to school for extended periods of time as they're growing up, which means there are gaps in their education and in their academic skills. There might also be a problem with lack of familiarity with technology. So depending on what background the language learner comes from, they might not have had computers readily available to them as they were growing up and going to school. And so technology use is not intuitive for them. And because of this, it might look like the individual is having a problem with the language when in fact, they're having a problem with the technology. For example, I had one student who had difficulty using Microsoft Word and typing on the computer. So when he had to type a two or a three page essay, it would take him a number of hours to do that, which meant he would have to stretch his typing over a couple of days. So because he was typing over many hours, over two or three days, he would often forget what he was talking about at the beginning of the essay, or he would miss simple mistakes with grammar or spelling. And so the result was that it looked like he was having difficulty with the language when in fact he was just wrestling with the technology. We should also take into account the fears and anxieties from being a language learner. For example, many language learners have a fear of doing new things and talking to new people. If it's difficult for you to use the language and you're not sure if you're going to understand if somebody talks to you, then you're just going to be less likely to do things or to go up and talk to people. There's also the fear of people being impatient with you. It's going to take a language learner longer to process something that's said and then to process how they're going to respond to what is said. So this is going to require more turnaround time in their brain as they're interacting with somebody. And if they think that the person they're interacting with is going to be impatient with them, then they're probably just going to give up in the effort. There's also frustration at the difficulty of doing basic tasks. For example, imagine being an adult and being able to do all of the things that you can do as an adult, paying your bills, going to the doctor, 
taking care of your own business, and then trying to do that in another language where you basically have the vocabulary and the grammar of a child. This is going to severely restrict what you can do and increase the difficulty of doing even small things. Then there's frustration from having a limited personality. For example, if you're able to talk about a wide variety of topics in your first language and express yourself through humor and through nuance, and then when you're communicating in English, you basically have the grammar and vocabulary of a child, it's going to be much more difficult to do any of those things, to talk about all of the things you know, to talk about all of the experience you have, even to be funny in the language. So it seems like your personality is much smaller in the language you're learning than it actually is. And then there's the frustration from feeling on the outside. So again, if you have a limited personality, if you're not able to talk about a wide variety of topics, if you're not able to tell jokes and understand jokes, or just be involved in general conversations, you're going to feel like you're outside of any group that you're in the company of. So what can we do about this? Let's look at some practical solutions to many of these challenges by bringing them back to the four basic skills in language learning. That is reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So we're going to look at some practical suggestions and resources in each of these areas for language learners. First, there are reading skills. So what are the general problems with reading for English language learners? First, there's vocabulary, as we've discussed quite a bit so far. There's lack of experience reading in English, so there's a lack of reading fluency. There's the academic language they might have to deal with, for example, if they're going to college. And then there's ignorance of new topics. So if they're learning something new, they're not only having to deal with the language, they're having to deal with new ideas as well. And finally, there's unfamiliarity with discipline-specific texts, or basically how texts are organized in different disciplines. For example, if you're reading a biology textbook, or a history textbook, or a math textbook. If you're not used to the way the information is organized, that's going to create language problems as well. So let's see what this might be like. Try to read this passage and see how long it takes you, and if you can understand it. If you want to, you can pause the video and do it. So this is what you just read. Objective considerations of contemporary phenomena compel the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must invariably be taken into account. Basically, this is 38 words long, and it comes from George Orwell. So this is an example of academic language in English. So not only are you trying to deal with reading something like this, but you're also having to understand what the writer is even talking about. So if you think about how long it took you to read this, imagine multiplying that by a full page or a full chapter of academic text. This is only 38 words, but an average page of text is going to be somewhere around 300 words, so 10 times as long as this. So as you can see, reading in another language can be quite challenging, not to mention reading academic language. So how can we help language learners with their reading? First, try to give them lots of short reading practice consistently. So language learners need to build fluency in reading because many of them don't have much experience reading in English. Now, if a language learner is forced to read long sections of text, it's going to wear them out. However, if they have short pieces of text that they can read a little bit every day or a couple of times a day, they're more likely to do it, and it's going to give them consistent practice, which is what they need to build fluency. Also, try to provide opportunities for oral and oral reading, that is, listening and reading out loud. For example, reading out loud in class, listening to audiobooks, listening and reading on YouTube, and text-to-speech apps, things like that. There are apps available out there like this one called Speechify that will actually read text to you. So with this app, for example, you can install a plug-in with Google Chrome, I believe, and it will read web pages to you. You can upload PDFs and it will read the PDF to you. And you can even take pictures of books and it will read that page of text to you. And it actually works. I tried this myself with a pretty dense history textbook and it read it to me without any errors. Now this program actually requires a subscription fee if you want all of the features, but there is a free version that you can download. But this is a great resource for language learners because then they can read and hear at the same time. And as I mentioned in the last video, one of the biggest problems for language learners is connecting the spelling and the pronunciation of words together. Another resource when it comes to academic vocabulary is the YouTube channel that you're watching this video on right now. So this is my YouTube channel called How to English, and I've actually got a playlist on vocabulary learning. And in this playlist, I have some videos to help language learners build not only their vocabulary, but their vocabulary learning skills so that they can learn the vocabulary faster and better. For example, 
by looking at how we form words in English, by looking at the different aspects of knowing a word, by understanding how to guess word types and word meaning in context, even how to use a dictionary. And then there are flashcard apps that you can download like this one called Memrise. It uses a learning trick called spaced repetition to automatically sort out how often you're seeing the flashcards in your deck. So for example, when you're first learning something, you'll see it more frequently, and then later on, you'll see it less and less frequently. So the flashcards in this app are actually designed by the users themselves, which means that you can find flashcards dealing with language learning, but you can also find flashcards dealing with different academic subjects. For example, I just did a quick search for anatomy and physiology, and I found a few different users who created flashcards for anatomy and physiology vocabulary. So if you teach a specific subject, then you could go and check out this app to see if there are any useful flashcard decks that are already available for your students. They can download the app for free, and then they can just study the vocabulary on their smartphone. And for each of these things that I've just shown, I'll put the links down in the description for this video. Now, a special form of reading is directions. Language learners often have difficulty with directions because they're written in a way that's confusing. So there are things that teachers can do when they write their directions to help make them a little bit more user-friendly for their students. For example, try to avoid complex sentences. Try short, direct sentences. Use simple vocabulary. Imagine that you're trying to give these directions to a grade schooler. Would they be able to understand your sentence structure? Would they be able to understand the vocabulary that you're using? Try to put organizing language up front in the directions, like the words then, next, after that, etc. So if you put the organizing language at the beginning of the sentence, then it will be easy for the language learner to see how the next step relates to the previous step in the directions. And if a student is having difficulty understanding directions, try to have them read the directions out loud. Sometimes, especially for those language learners who have learned English through conversation, when they hear it read out loud, then it will click with them. Whereas if they just read it silently in their heads, they might not understand what's being said. Also, try to give students exposure to the same kinds of activities throughout the semester. That way they can use their logic and their experience to fill in any gaps where they don't understand exactly what the directions are saying. They can look at the activity and say, oh, I've done this activity before, so I already know how to do it. Also, try to make the visual layout of directions more approachable. As I mentioned before, if a language learner has a large block of text to read, like an entire page, it can be very exhausting to do that and the brain just wants to shut off. They don't want to keep on reading. So try to break up the directions and make them a little bit easier to look at. For example, for one of my classes, this is how I write the directions. And I'm still trying to improve my own methods, but these have seemed to work okay so far, even though there's quite a few steps in these directions. So what I've done is, is I've tried to divide each step of the directions into a separate bullet point or into a separate line. So basically I only have one sentence per line, maybe two at most. And you can see I've tried to put the organizing language up front so that they can see how one thing relates to the next thing. And then I've indented things to show that these things here, for example, are describing this step up here that they're doing. So by breaking it up like this, it, it makes it just a little bit easier for language learners to process because they can just read it one bullet point at a time and then they can just follow the directions step by step. Now, if I was to put all of this into a paragraph, which I'll admit I actually did at first, uh, it makes it more difficult for them to follow and then they're gonna ask a lot more questions about the directions. So I just started separating each sentence into its own bullet point. Now when it comes to writing skills, some general problems that language learners have with writing are again the vocabulary, their limited grammar proficiency, the academic language that they're using because they often write like they talk, and their lack of general computer literacy as I mentioned before, which includes a lack of keyboarding skills. So what can we do about this? First, try to provide examples of what you expect. If a language learner can see an example of what they're supposed to produce, it goes a long way to helping them to understand how they can do it themselves. So if they can see a clear example of what you need them to do, then they're more likely to have success with the assignment. Also, when you're giving directions and when you're talking about the assignment, try to emphasize the main point or the main goal of the writing. Again, if they understand what the point of it is or what the goal of it is, then they can use their logic to fill in any gaps in their understanding. 
Also, when you're giving them feedback or correcting anything, try to give it little by little. Try to address their errors or their problems in order of importance when it comes to intelligibility. That is, when you're reading something that they wrote, try to pinpoint what it is that's giving you the biggest difficulties with understanding them. Try to zero in on one or two or maybe three big things and give them feedback on those things and just choose to ignore the other things for now. If you give them too much feedback at one time, it's just gonna overload them. But if you can show them one or two areas where they're making consistent mistakes, then it will be easier for them to make a systemic fix so you can get more bang for your buck. Also, try to encourage keyboarding practice. So if you're a writing teacher or there's a lot of writing involved where they have to type, if they become better at keyboarding, it will help them to more easily put their thoughts in writing without having to wrestle with the typing program and without losing their train of thought. So here, for example, is a typing program that is available for free online from a website called typing.com. So using this program, students can build up their typing skills for free at home. And it's also got some other uh, digital literacy skills that they can access as well on the website. And again, I'll put the link down below in the description. Another resource to plug my YouTube channel again is a playlist that I have on specifically grammar. So if students go to this playlist on grammar, then they're able to review very basic and specific grammar points such as adjectives, pronouns, verb forms, uh, using descriptive language, talking about the past, talking about the future, and those kinds of things. So if you see any kind of specific error that your students are making, then you can just send them to the playlist on my YouTube channel to that specific lesson so that they can just review it. And I try to make the videos, you know, 10 to 15 minutes long. Sometimes they're a little bit longer. Now let's look at listening skills. So some common problems that language learners have with listening and speaking are again, vocabulary, the connected or reduced speech that I described in the second video, metaphor, idiom, slang, and jargon, which I also mentioned in the second video, cultural knowledge and reference, discourse styles, such as the way lectures are structured and organized, the way a question and answer session works, the way group discussion works, and time pressure. This is a big one because when you're listening, you basically only have one chance to hear what's been said. And sometimes you need to answer so this can put a lot of pressure on a language learner because not only are they trying to understand what was said, but they're also trying to formulate how they're gonna to respond to it. Now, in order for a language learner to be successful with listening, they need to have a stronger vocabulary. They need to understand the context of what they're listening to. They need to have more familiarity with the discourse style that's being used, and they need to use their logic and experience. So to help them build their vocabulary and their discourse fluency in listening, Try to provide relevant supplemental listening options, especially with captioning. For example, movies, television shows, TED Talks, podcasts, YouTube videos, things like that. Especially if you're teaching a specific subject, the more exposure they can get to that subject, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, is only going to help them more and more. For example, there was one woman I worked with who was from Russia. When she started learning English, she had a difficult time of it. And then she started watching a lot of television shows. One of her favorite shows was Grey's Anatomy. And so she watched Grey's Anatomy over and over and over again. Now, as it happened, one time she was at a medical conference and they needed somebody to translate from English into Russian. And because she had watched Grey's Anatomy enough, she had enough vocabulary and fluency in the topic to be able to basically discuss what was being talked about. And as a matter of fact, she's gone on to become a medical interpreter. And this started with her just watching television shows in English. To increase culture, metaphor, and idiom fluency, again, to plug my channel, I've got a playlist specifically dealing with American idioms. And the way that I teach these idioms is by bringing them back to the context where they originally came from. For example, I look at idioms that have come from poker and gambling, from boxing, from baseball, from games, from business. Each of these videos has 30 different idioms and I go through these idioms and I don't only explain what they mean, I also tie it back to the culture and how we got it from the culture, helping them to understand both American culture and the idioms themselves. Now, if you give a language learner directions in the classroom, especially orally, it's important to check for understanding, to make sure they understand what you're telling them. You need to be careful when they're saying, uh-huh, or just nodding their head. Try to ask clarifying questions. 
have them repeat instructions back to you or key points of what you said in order to check and make sure that they actually did understand what you told them. For example, here's an admission from one language learner. Sometimes I can catch the whole sentence, but I can't understand the true meaning of the words. When I couldn't understand the speaker's words, I give a smiling to response it. Maybe I look a little wooden, but I have no choice. If I always ask the speaker to say again, he or she will feel too boring with me. So basically they would smile, nod, say uh-huh when they were getting directions, even though they didn't understand what was going on. And this is very, very common. I've been in this situation myself, living in foreign countries. Somebody's trying to tell you something and you're just trying to think of the fastest way to get out of that situation. So you smile, you nod, you don't know what was said, and you just move on with things, hoping that you don't screw something up. Now, when you're giving oral instructions, again, try to use simple vocabulary and grammar. As I mentioned before with written directions, imagine that you're giving these directions to a grade schooler. This is not to say that the language learners are unintelligent. It's just that they're working with a smaller set of vocabulary and grammar. Also, try to provide an example or two or go over the first couple of problems together in class. When it comes to understanding lectures, try to recap the previous class or lecture and connect it to the current one. Again, this is tapping into the language learner's logic. If they can connect what they're doing today with what they did yesterday or last week, it'll help their brain to connect the dots so that their logic can fill in any gaps in their language knowledge. Try to give the big picture for the lesson. So if you can give an overview at the beginning of what you're going to be talking about or what the main point of the lesson is, then again, they'll be able to use their logic throughout the lecture or throughout the class to fill in for when they got lost with the language or what was going on. Try to provide notes, outlines, and key vocabulary before a lecture or before a class. Basically, give the language learner a leg up or an advantage before they even walk into the classroom so that they've got some kind of idea of how the lecture is going to be organized and what kinds of words and phrases they're going to be hearing during the lecture or during the class. And try to support what you're saying with visuals. The more that they can see, whether with body language or what you're writing on the board or videos or pictures, the more it's going to help them, again, to fill in the gaps with the language that they don't understand. And also, you can try to have language learners collaborate with other successful students on note-taking and studying. So if they can work together with a peer, then it will be a lower stress situation for them to pick up good study skills. Now let's talk about your language use in the classroom. Try to repeat, restate, and provide examples as much as possible. As I mentioned before, one of the difficulties with listening is that the language learner only gets one chance to hear what was said. So if they miss something and it was only said one time, then they won't have heard it. But if you repeat and restate what you were talking about and provide examples, it gives them multiple opportunities, not only to understand what's being said, but also to catch it if they missed it the first time. Also, try to clarify important cultural reference that you're using in the classroom. Sometimes when you're giving an example, you'll use a cultural reference to do it. But language learners often won't have that cultural background, that cultural knowledge to be able to pick up the reference so the example would be useless in that case. So if you're giving a cultural reference, try to pick something that's going to be known to the majority of people in the class or try to explain it if you don't think the language learner is going to understand it as well. Try to avoid obscure or unnecessary cultural reference. So telling jokes, telling stories, things like that, because it's just going to throw the language learner off in knowing whether this is important information or unimportant information. And again, if they don't pick up the cultural reference, it's going to make them feel like they're on the outside of the group. Also, try to monitor your own use of idioms, metaphor, and jargon. For example, if somebody did a really good job, we might tell them, you really hit a home run. Now, a language learner is probably not going to have the cultural knowledge to know what a home run is. And so when they hear the idiom, they're not going to know what you're talking about. So instead of using idioms, Try to just use clear, direct language if possible. And this can be very difficult to do because we get so used to using some idioms in our everyday conversation because it's faster and it's easier than trying to think of a new way to say something. So just pay attention to see, am I using any idioms commonly? And then try to think of another more clear and direct way to say it. Also, try to avoid digressions. Or if you do go into a digression, Try to make it known as a digression. You can just start by saying, now this isn't important or this is a little bit off topic or something like that so that the language learners in the class know that this doesn't have the same importance as the main topic that you've been talking about. Also, 
and this should go without saying, but just speak clearly. That is, monitor your volume, how you're articulating your words, how you're pausing, and try to use full sentences. So this doesn't just mean speak louder. Sometimes as we're getting to the end of a point, our volume starts to drop or we start to mumble. Also, if we're just trying to get all of our ideas out as fast as possible, we start to get sloppy with our articulation or how clearly we're saying our words. And also pausing makes a big difference in being intelligible to a language learner. When a language learner says that somebody talks too fast, it's not normally because of the speed that they're saying the words. It's because of how short the pauses are in between the words and in between the phrases and the chunks of language. So if you can pause at the ends of your chunks of language, it gives the language learner time to process what you're saying. And when you're speaking, try to speak in full sentences because often when we're talking to people of our same language, because there are parts of sentences that we already know, we tend to just drop information off. Like we can drop the subject off the sentence or a helping verb if there's a helping verb. And a native speaker will understand what's being said very easily because it's a common thing to drop. But for non-native speakers, they might not be used to dropping those parts of the sentences that get repeated often. So if you're dropping them off, then they're not going to pick up the full context of the sentence. So it's just more helpful if you speak in full, direct sentences. Now, when it comes to speaking skills, there are a few things that we can do to help language learners, but ultimately it's going to come down to their own practice. First, try to provide opportunities for listening. The more a language learner hears the language being spoken by native speakers, the more their brain will catalog the language, which will make it available for them when they're trying to speak. So the more listening practice they get, actually the better they'll get at speaking. Also, try to provide opportunities for low stress communication. As I mentioned before, listening can be stressful for non-native speakers. So if you can put them into a low stress situation, it will help them to speak with less pressure, which will help their brain to function more smoothly. So for example, try to put them into small groups or if you need to talk to them, try to interact with them one-on-one -on -one after class or in your office because then it doesn't put the pressure on them of having to say something in front of other students or in front of an entire class. Also, similar to the recommendation I gave for writing, try to identify the key problems with intelligibility when they're speaking. So as I said with the writing, try to look for the common errors that they're making and try to order them according to how important they are for understanding them. So if you can do this when they're speaking, if you're having a hard time understanding them when they're talking to you, try to figure out what it is that's making it most difficult for you to understand them and then give them one or two polite suggestions about trying this or trying that. And most language learners will just thank you for your advice and they'll try and take it on board. But most of these skills come back to a matter of motivation. When it comes to language learning, there are basically two kinds of motivation. There's the motivation driven by needs and there's the motivation driven by attitudes. So a language learner might need to learn the language in order to graduate from school or to get a job or to perform in their job. But they're also gonna have attitudes toward the language. So if they have poor attitudes toward the language and specifically toward the language community, then it's gonna impede and slow down their acquisition of the language. This means that their experience with native speakers of the language is gonna go a long way toward helping them to improve in their language learning. So if you would like to know what it's like to be a language learner in a classroom, try watching this lecture. I'll put the link below in the description. As you watch the lecture, try to notice how difficult is it for you to understand the lecturer? Why specifically is he difficult for you to understand? What is your brain and body doing to compensate for your difficulties in understanding? And what is the lecturer doing to help you to understand him better? If you watch the video and do these things, then you'll start to get inside the head of a language learner when they're sitting in one of your classes. In the end, language is a community resource. If you have it, you can participate in the community. If you don't have it, you will not be able to participate and as a result, not feel yourself part of the community. Ultimately, language learning is like an initiation into the community, which means that the current members of the community have a responsibility and an opportunity in the process. Hopefully, this video series has helped to provide some perspective on what it's like to try to learn English, and also what you can do to support those language learners in your sphere who are on their own English learning journey. Thanks for watching.